Soft Robotics is finally leaving the research lab and entering the real world. One of the companies leading the way is a startup based in Boston that is commercializing the innovations of the Whitesides Research Group at Harvard. I'm talking today with Soft Robotics CEO, Carl Voss. So our expertise, Andrea, is really is in the, the soft actuator, where we're able to make robotic actuators out of completely elastomeric materials. So rubbers, silicone rubbers, polyurethanes. And so it's really a different aspect to making what you, you're normally used to as rigid manipulators, parallel bar linkages, or linear actuators. We're really doing it without any rigid components. And what research has this come out of? So this, the company was actually uh, spun out of Harvard. In 2007, there was a DARPA project um, called ChemBots, and Harvard was an awardee on that project, and Professor George Whitesides in the chemistry department actually took up the challenge, not a traditional robotics research institute, but the Harvard chemistry department, and the inspiration was the octopus, and it was, could you build an octopus? So instead of trying to build a, a mechatronic-type robot that we're all familiar with, they developed a soft actuator trying to replicate the tentacle, if you will. And out of that came the intellectual property that is called uh, pneumatic networks. And then using the, the pneumatic networks, you can build all these different actuators to make fingers, hands, joints, um, and the like. And Harvard worked on this for about five to six years. And then there was a decision that the technology had matured to the point where it was no longer in the best interest to continue research and really to start commercializing the technology and using it to solve some, some well understood problems out there. And so the company was put together in the uh, late spring, early summer of 2013. And what are some of the problems and the specific applications that you're looking at for soft robotics? One of the things that's really interesting about the technology is it's, um, it's low cost, it's conformal, and you can design the, the hands in an open loop system to, to apply just the right amount of force, if you will. An example I use is picking a tomato off of a vine. This would be a very, very difficult problem for a traditional robotic manipulator to do with the closed loop feedback. And what we can do is we can design a soft hand with elastomeric fingers that will only operate at a force that is below the crush um, force of a tomato, if you will. And so you just simply um, visualize the tomato, you activate the, the gripper, it'll grab the tomato and pull it. And so this really opens up what, what I like to think of as the future of robotics into collaborative robotics. So having robotics be able to work side by side with, with people in factories on assembly lines, handing instruments and tools to workers on the assembly line, or automating areas we haven't been able to automate right now. So um, produce processing. So how do, how do we automate uh, food processing. Right now, it's very hard to handle fruits and vegetables with robots, but we really feel that soft robotics will, will unlock this capability. Absolutely. So you've mentioned collaborative robotics, the ability to safely work alongside people as one of the significant benefits, and also opening up new areas, uh, for example, handling food and agricultural products. Do you think this will also apply to some of the other areas that have not been um, so easy for robotic manipulation, like fabrics, textiles, other deformable materials? A a absolutely, Andrew, and I think that's one of the things, um, one of the big challenges in robotics is how do you handle these soft things, so um, shirts. So if, you, if you're if you shipping a shirt from the shirt manufacturer um, to um, maybe an outlet like the Gap or something, or even an e-commerce outlet, they come folded in a, in a plastic wrap. And picking up a folded shirt in a plastic wrap with a robotic manipulator is very, very difficult. But that has been something that we've actually um, shown we're able to do is to handle these delicate, highly unstructured objects and, and do them with a lower complexity than is, is done today. Um, and that same uh, grasper that we demonstrated handling a folded shirt could also pick up a bag of rice, if you will, or um, things as, as as variety as varied as uh, children's toys. Now, I find soft robotics a very interesting area because of these wide applications, but uh, naturally there are some limitations as well. I assume there's trade-offs in accuracy or perhaps in strength. Where do you feel the, the boundaries of the applications are? One of the things we're really focused on, oh, I'm sorry, Andrew, um, the, 
the, the biggest feedback we get right now is um, lifespan because traditionally in the research environment, soft robotic um, devices have not had the best lifespan, uh, very low cycles. And when we're talking about automating things such as whether it's textile handling, produce handling, um, or collaborative robotics is you, you need to have cyclic um, lifetimes that are similar to traditional hard graspers. And that's a problem that we've really focused on solving. Um, right now in our lab, we do have one of our self manipulators running on a um, lifetime test. And I can tell you, as of this morning, we're approaching 3 million cycles. And so we feel like um, we, we've really approached that life cycle, lifetime problem that uh, some self robotic technologies have had. The other um, challenge we have had and are working on addressing is that speed of grasp, because sometimes self robotics, you're really, you're moving a, a fluid, whether it's pneumatic or hydraulic. And it's, it's obviously a slower rate than electrical motor, but we've also demonstrated grass times in the 100 milliseconds range. And so we really feel that the current limitations are well known, um, but that they can be solved and, and solving those is deterministic. Okay, and there are some advantages as well, do you think, in terms of the cost and power to weight ratios? A absolutely, so that's one of the biggest advantages that we, we found out is right now we have a we have a small a small gripper that's a, a light payload gripper, so it's it can handle about 600 grams right now um, reliably, but it's only 100 gram um, is the actual weight of the device, and so when you put that on the end of a one kilogram arm, you you've got quite a bit more payload than a traditional device where you're looking at maybe half of your end of arm payload may be taken up by the actual weight of the end effector, and so we're able to create. Uh, very lightweight end effectors, which actually make these lightweight collaborative arms much more productive in, in payload capacity. The other advantage that's really been um, a powerful part of software bikes is the cost. Um, all of our cost really goes into the engineering of the devices, but what we once we begin manufacturing a device, it's really composed of proprietary design of the actuators and then a lightweight material such as polycarbonate and uh, silicon elastomers. And so we're not talking about an, an end effector that's got a lot of sensors and stepper motors and linkages in it. And so we really believe that the what is considered the standard cost for a um, adaptable end effector today is that we can come down in price by you know, an order of magnitude uh, very easily, which is really important to opening up this this new market of collaborative robotics. You're having to create a startup that's going into uncharted waters, and I'm hoping you can tell me a little bit about the process. So, Soft Robotics has been um, uh, in existence as a company for just over one year. Yeah, July of 2013. And how many are there in your team? So right now, there's five of us. And there's, um, two full-time engineers, um, myself. And then we uh, use two consultants to keep the books and, and take care of our, our regulatory responsibilities. And your background is not in robotics research so much as it is in um, business, and you've been doing medical devices before this. How did you come to join Soft Robotics? Uh, um, many, many years ago, my undergraduate degree is in electrical engineering, and I worked on doing stepper motor control with 8-bit microcontrollers. And we were writing um, assembly language at the time, and it was very miserable. And I went off and had forgotten all about that and was spending a lot of time in medical devices, was introduced to the technology. We were looking at uh, various medical applications for the technology because of the soft conformal nature. Obviously, you can just, the thing that makes soft robotics fantastic for handling tomatoes also makes it fantastic for handling uh, human organs. But really, when we got started, I remembered all the difficulties I had with control systems and feedback loops and all of those things and realized that we had a soft open loop uh, manipulator technology and that we should really spend time with the robotics community. And once we sat down with the robotics community, uh, it's been unbelievable feedback of, you know, this is the kind of thing we've been waiting for. We've been trying to make the human hand, and that's a very costly endeavor that takes a long time and an effort and is difficult and you've done, you've created this highly dexterous, um, conformal, you know, lightweight device in, in a short period of time. And so with, with that initial feedback, we really decided to, to put um, all of our major efforts focusing on the robotics opportunity. 
has this been supported through commercialization grants through the university through the labs through what's the process that has taken you this far and what's coming next so um the one thing i will tell you is it's very difficult to run a hardware startup these days um you know these, we're in the days of mobile apps and and wonderful um online portals that can access billions of people but hardware startups require people and engineers and time and so we were lucky in that we did get um, some initial funding through the government uh, two DARPA grants where DARPA had seen the technology in the university and asked for us to push it forward. And at the same time, we've been very lucky with angel um, angel investors. And so the company has been funded uh, partially through government grants and the majority through angel investors who have seen the technology. They've, they've done their, their fact checking with the robotics community and they they believe that this is something that will will change robotics and will be very very important going forward. Yeah, I have to agree. What I see is that angels are playing quite an important role in getting robotic startups up to closer to the to a large seed round or a Series A round. And it is a slower process than it is for many other startups. Um, certainly, mobile and apps uh, tend to give give the impression of being yeah. cheap and easy to get off the ground and it's not totally the case whereas with hardware it's rarely the case that it's cheap and easy um now just a point there um it, it's very interesting because many of the discussions i have with investors is i try to to help them understand that we we need to buy um, materials we need to fabricate things we need to um have access to a machine shop and these are not things they're accustomed to hearing from people working on software. What do you think is coming up that you're facing? So I, I think right now, Andrew, um, if I could just step back, the biggest obstacles, and this is when you're taking the technology out of a university, is the universities do very cutting edge, early, early stage research. And, and they're not concerned with things like cost and manufacturability and scalability of a business process. And that is really what we spent the first nine months working on, is could we get to a good design space where we could build soft robotics in a CAD, a 3D CAD system? And that, that required a lot of work for our engineers. Second, we had to find um, vendors who could help us actually manufacture the parts in quantity so that when we did start engaging companies, we could sit down and say, look, we've got a design space. We understand the, the design variables to solve these problems. And we have a manufacturing house who can make these in lots of a hundred, lots of a thousand if, if desired. And so that's been, uh, that was a good nine months of the, the, the beginning of the company. Now it's really understanding where the, the, the most important problem to solve is, if that makes sense. Um, we, we can do a lot of things um, with the soft uh, gripper. You know, we, we've had suggestions for, um, you know, manipulating um, chickens and in, um, in poultry processing, which is very interesting, but I, I know very little about poultry processing. And so we've been engaging, obviously, the integrators, the end users, as well as the robotics companies to really understand um, what problems they would like to see solved. And to just kind of circle back the the dominant themes really are the collaborative robotics, realizing that dream of collaborative robotics. And then at the same time, there are industries that we would like to automate, or parts of industries we'd like to automate, that just haven't been um, conducive to, to robotics as they are today. But the feedback is with soft robotics, we could really bring automation to, to those new markets. Are you going to tackle this one market at a time, prove one out, and then add another? or prove one out and then add 10 or 100 others? So, so um, I, I would say there may be a third way, which um, what I'd like to do is the, what you said, the, the former, is prove one out, is to focus on one market, really show that we can make a difference, and then use the technology to go into new markets. Um, and as an early stage startup, uh, focus really is important to, to our success. But what we are finding is that as we're proving out these these one markets, one of the things we've been focused on quite a bit is the unstructured warehousing environment, um, is the ability to um, pack something that comes in a small electronics box, such as a phone or a tablet, or that, that shirt that's wrapped in cellophane, or a football. Um, 
manipulating all these with the same system is very challenging, and that's that's a problem we we believe we can solve, and we've been focused on. But in that process, we have found that there's a lot of things that people would like us just to focus on. The textiles is a good example. Produce is a good example. So to, to kind of bring it back to your original question, we are focusing on um, you know single markets at a time. But as as we're we focused on making a difference in those um, that series processing, if you will, what we're really learning more that's allowing us to open up new conversations in the new markets. What do you think is the single biggest obstacle that you're facing in terms of startup growth? Is it, um, and this could range from recruitment to tools to facilities to funding to things that I haven't even thought of mentioning. So I, I, I would say funding is, if, if I was giving advice to someone who's going to start a robotic startup today, I would have them really spend a lot of time on how to fund the company. Um, we were at the Massachusetts Innovation Unconference two weeks ago, and we actually ran a session on um, funding the hardware startup. Um, because it's very, it's a very different endeavor because today the traditional backers, the venture capitalists of the world would really like to see traction. Traction is the big word you hear in startups today. For a robotics company, that means you have to have a prototype or you have to be running live pilots with potential paying customers or potential uh, business partners. And so understanding the path and the funding necessary to get you from a really good idea or a, or a core technology to where you could have a pilot running in a customer so then you could stand in front of a venture capitalist and say, this is real technology. We have solved the scientific risk, if you will, so we can make it work and we have a meaningful customers who are interested in technology. Understanding that that's the journey you're going to be required to walk today, I think can bring clarity to a lot of the business plans out there today. Um, unfortunately, the world of where you could have really great intellectual property and a really great idea and get funding, it, it's just become more difficult um, in, in recent years. And so getting to that, that first customer contact is very, very important. I agree. And I think by definition, there's um, a lot of intellectual property out there, but it's hard to prove that it has value Yes. unless you have developed um, traction. I'd actually avoided using that word, even though it's written down in my notes. So thank you for bringing that up. Oh, you're quite welcome. And um, you actually have just given advice to a startup, but um, I'll, I'll, I'll ask you, first off, is there anything that you would like to say that we haven't covered? And secondly, do you have some tips for startups that you'd like to share? Absolutely. I, I would say that there's three things about doing a robotic startup today that I think are very important. One is everyone is fascinated by robotics. And so it's whenever I'm out somewhere and someone hears the word robotics, they're very interested in what we're doing. But as we've, we've discussed many times at the trade shows, the public perception of robotics is very different from the reality of robotics. And, and helping bridge that gap, if you will, that... Um, the problems we're trying to solve today versus the reality of the, the Rosie the maid is the example we all like to use is, is a wide gulf. And then third is that that is what you're going to have to do when you speak with investors, whether they be potential angel investors or venture capitalist investors, is really helping them understand um, the reality of robotics today, but then the vision of what robotics can be and how you're, you're going to help move the, the industry forward, I think is is really the, the key, I would say. If you can remember those three things, you can be very successful in, in this industry. That's great. Thank you very much for your time there. I really enjoyed the discussion.